You're listening to Content Logistics, a podcast for B2B marketers looking to build a content engine that drives revenue. In each episode, Camille Trent interviews the marketers behind the best content marketing flywheels and uncovers the tactical aspects of content production from first draft to first customer. Welcome to another episode of Content Logistics. I'm your host, Camille Trent, and this episode is brought to you by my good friends, Tristan and Justin over at Motion. Motion is an agency that helps busy B2B tech marketers launch podcasts just like this one. In fact, this podcast was launched by Motion. And if you're wanting to launch a podcast, I highly recommend you check them out because they do all of the hard part. They do the cutting of the clips. They do the design. They find the clips. They find the quotes. They make me look professional. And what I do is sit here and talk to people like Zoe Hartsfield who is the community manager over at Speckett and former beloved coworker of mine. So I wanted to bring her on to talk through the logistics of growing on LinkedIn. Zoe, welcome to Content Logistics. For everyone who's listening, Zoe and I used to work together and then she left me. So that's, <laughs> that's where we're at now. So now Zoe, correct me if I'm wrong, but community manager at Speckett? Yes, community manager at Speckett. That's, that's what they call me. <laughs> that's what they call you now for for one one week strong two weeks strong yeah I, we are about to round out week two it's been a whirlwind but it's been fun excellent okay so I'm bringing you on here because you are the master at LinkedIn everybody would like to level up their LinkedIn game but really just kind of an open chat about how both of us like got started and some things that we learned along the way I think your journey is especially interesting because you mentioned that you started doubling down January of last year. It's mm -hmm. now like January of 2022. And so you have a full like 360 view of LinkedIn and how you've gotten where you are now. So I think it's a good look back for people of like what can be accomplished in a year and how to get started. So let's just start there. Why LinkedIn? Why did you double down? So early days, I was an SDR. I tried using LinkedIn a little bit and like creating content in 2020. And I was not super consistent, but I found that like, as I showed up, I was gaining followers and like starting more conversations. People were engaging with me. And the most important thing is I was getting good responses from my LinkedIn DMs. So I was mostly on LinkedIn to like find prospects, essentially. Like a lot of salespeople are. They're not there to build a brand. They're just like, this is a step in my sequence, so I need to send this DM to this person. But I started seeing success with my LinkedIn DMs and connecting. So that's where I initially found myself on LinkedIn. And it also connected me to some interesting mentors and thought leaders. Like one of my mentors today, Corey Kosick, CEO of Aspireship. Morgan Ingram, friend of mine. Like all of those relationships started through LinkedIn DMs. So it started early days, very conversational. What happened is in January last year, I noticed that like, when I started posting about my experience as an SDR or my transition into marketing or anything about video prospecting at all, people were like, whoa, like I can learn something from this. And I was getting DMs from people saying like, I tried your video trick and it worked. And I realized, oh, like I know a thing that helps other people. So I'm going to start writing about that. What other experiences can I share that people might find valuable. And let's be honest, I am an approval gremlin till the day I die. So I like it when people are like, hey, we love you. I'm a stranger. You're great. So it boosts my ego a whole lot if I'm being totally, totally candid. But yeah, it really was born out of I was in sales. I need to hit my number. This was a way to do that. And then it became like a more exciting and interesting space to be a part of. So Jan last year, I think I had close to 3000 connections. And I think Right now, I'm, I'm at the 18K mark. So about 15,000 in 12 months. Nice. Okay, let's dig into the success metric. So you talked about you were starting to see a success in the DMs. So what does that mean? Did that mean the people that were coming inbound to you based on the posts that you were putting out or when you were going outbound as an SDR or both? So both. It started outbound. And one of the things that I did as an SDR was instead of pitching in my initial connection request, I sent a little like eight to 10 second video that was like, hey, my name's Zoe. Nice to meet you. Excited to follow along with your content. Don't be a stranger. Reach out anytime if you need anything. That was it. No ask, no pitch. Really brief, base to the name kind of a thing. And people loved it. 
they were like, oh, this was like so pleasant. And also the video software I was using at the time very clearly displayed the number of seconds the video was in the thumbnail. So it was like they knew they were only committing to an eight second video. What damage could I possibly do in eight seconds? So I had a really, really great play rate and a positive response. Like, like it didn't mean, oh, this video was amazing. Can I book a meeting to talk to you about whatever it is that you're selling? They had no idea what I was selling or like what I really did. It was just a, hey, nice to meet you. And so that was really well received. What was even cooler was when I started going and creating content on LinkedIn last year. I was no longer in SDR, I was in marketing. But I would post about video prospecting and the product we sold at the time was a video software. And I started getting all these inbound DMs of like, hey, can you tell me about your product? And I was no longer in sales anymore, but I tracked those conversations and I would pass them over to the sales team. And I think my, like just posting content for the first, I don't know, three months of that year that I was working for that company, I generated like 35 opportunities for the sales team from like inbound questions about our software. And I was like, oh, why wasn't I doing this when I was an SDR? So that's how we got here. Nice. Yeah. I think that's like good a, good a reason as any if you want 35 opportunities for your sales team slash if you want to grow to 18K followers. That's a pretty good why. Is now a good time still to, to get started on LinkedIn? Obviously, as platforms mature, like the payoff, like maybe is, is harder to get to or not worth it. So what are your thoughts on like starting on starting from zero from LinkedIn now? I would say it's still early days enough that you could do it. I think it's going to be different. Like, I don't expect this year for me to grow at the rate that I grew last year, to be totally honest. I don't have expectations of like, oh, I'm going to have 40,000 followers by the end of this year. I don't think so. But I do think it's still not an overly saturated market. What I would encourage someone is if they are starting today, when I first started, I was just posting like any random thought that came to mind. And because I knew how to video prospect, a lot of it was that. And so it was actually more specific when I started because I only like thought about video prospecting. Now that I'm a marketer and I have gone to two different companies since then, I have to like rein in my content and get a little bit more specific. I think if you started today and you're like, I'm going to post every thought I have under the sun. People aren't going to know what to come to you for. Like when I think of you, Camille, I'm like content marketing masterclass. If I have any content marketing questions, content strategy questions, like I'm going to Camille. And you've done a really good job like establishing your voice as an authority on like creative content and like campaigns and content strategy. But like if you posted on Monday about your dog and then on Tuesday about like real estate investing and on Thursday about content and on Friday about like your boss, it might be less clear to me what problem I would go to you for or like what problem you would solve. So early days, I was not very clear. I think I'm getting more dialed in these days. So to anybody starting, if you feel like it's too late, it's probably not. But start with like an idea in mind of what I wanted to learn three years ago from somebody like who had more experience. How can I like provide that value to the community? Excellent advice because I just had this conversation with an AE outreach like the other day and we were just chatting through and because he had taken the time to talk to me about sales, right? And so afterwards I was like, can I do anything for you? Like, is there any value that I can provide you in this call? And so we talked about LinkedIn a little bit and mentioned this of just decide like, what do you want to be known for, right? Like, what do you want to be associated with in your post? And then gave him a couple of pointers on how to structure the hook, basically how to have a hook at the beginning of it but then yeah this this week like he had a post that was like in the hundreds <laughs> i was like you're killing it already and so that's always just good to see but i think that's like one of the number one mistakes that people make is just not knowing what to post or not being like focused enough in the posts and it seems hard right it seems like how can i come up with enough content marketing content right or how, how can i come up with enough uh, video prospecting content but it actually makes it a lot easier in a lot of ways because you have like this focus and you're like, this is like the playground that we're going to play in rather than like sky's the limit. And then just being like this little like puppy dog that's distracted by like every shiny object. That being said, like I've had some definite like puppy dog posts as well. And so oh, I, I yeah. think you can instantly I'm appreciate that. I'm still dialing it in. Like I would not say I have nailed like a perfect focus just yet. 
And so if you look at my content over the last six months, it probably looks really crazy, which is fine. But I do think that there's value in like niching down earlier. And to your point, yeah, like it might seem limiting, but at the end of the day, you're an expert in your experience. Nobody has more authority to speak on what you know about than you. So if you look at it through that lens, you kind of have like an infinite number of things to talk about because something that might feel obvious to me could be like a light bulb moment for somebody else that they've never. I used to think some of the video stuff that I did was so basic. And I was like, nobody's going to care about this like outreach video hack that I have where I know that my like video was forwarded. And then I posted about it and it like 500 people that day liked it. Hundreds of comments, people DMing me being like, wait, can you like show me one more time? Like it was a little bit blurry. Can I see like I use outreach? Can I see how you did that? kind of a thing and it may seem obvious to you but it could be really helpful to somebody else yeah I mean if, if nothing else like I think that's like the number one thing people can get from this specific episode is like don't assume right like don't assume that you know your audience or that you know like what their experience is like you said you're the expert in your experience like that's great and doubling down on that and then the other thing too is I always say like let your audience like be your editor right and so what that means though, is sometimes when I do have different styles of posts or different types of content, I'll like look to see who is engaging with it. And oftentimes I'm surprised, right? I'm like, oh, like this thing about content marketing is like really appealing to sales leaders. Like I wouldn't have guessed that. And so sort of like figuring out why too, if somebody, for instance, Reese reaches out and is like, I like that post. It's like, why, why did you like it? Or what was interesting about it? So I always try and ask those follow-up questions too, but those are some good insights. So the last thing is, yeah, common pitfalls. What other things do people do wrong, like when they're first getting started? The number one thing I see people do when they first get started is they post a big block of text. I understand that the like line by line thing looks bananas. Like I get it. I had somebody recently at my current organization be like, I guess like it makes sense for the algorithm, but like, why do people do this? And I was like, well, it's for the algorithm, but also you have to think about like the reading experience. Like what's the experience of the person on the other side of your post? That line by line breakout makes your content very skimmable. So somebody doesn't need to read every single word to get the gist of the story that you're telling and they can consume more content at once, but also it requires them to hit see more, which increases your dwell time and like boosts you in the algorithm. So if you look at LinkedIn, you'll see most posts are broken out line by line or like a couple lines with like a break in between them. There is a very good reason for that, which I just explained, but I would encourage you to try and make your post like easy to consume, easy, whether that means it's short, whether it means it's broken out, whether it means it's compelling, like, are you making somebody better at their job or life? Do you make them feel something? If it is a no to both of those questions, I would start over and try again and I would break it out line by line yeah that's a great tip and i think knowing too as as you said before that like nothing in the universe is new like it's all pretty much out there and so you have to figure out your angle on it right and then what i'll say is like surface that to the top right like i need to know like what your unique angle is right away and also what value i'm gonna get from it right away and thinking about that in the first two lines because those that's like the preview that you see before clicking more it's almost like a an intro to sales. You're selling the rest of the post, right? Like it's ad copy at the end of the day or, or subject line copy. Like if you have any experience in sales, any experience in marketing, like you understand how to write a compelling subject line because nobody will open your email if you don't. And so I think of it that way. It's like, what's going to get them to open the rest of this email? What's going to get them to press see more? Are you providing value or intrigue in that first line or two enough for them to want to hear how it ends. And that's like kind of what I think about. Also, I've recently started challenging myself, like, would I read and enjoy this content? And if I'm being like very honest with myself, there's plenty of content I've written that I wouldn't. And I just like did it to like please the algorithm gods. But I am lately really challenging myself to be like, if I wouldn't stop and read this, like I'm not gonna post it. And that has kind of changed the way that I'm writing on linkedin these days too yeah that's an excellent tip because i'll catch myself like being lazy too but at my best like i would do that of like am i actually learning something as i'm writing this right like did i have like 
kind of a rough idea that I just kind of like put out there without kind of refining and letting kind of my audience edit it for me or do the hard work for me? Or like, did I kind of like refine that thought and package it in a way that somebody hasn't seen before and in a way that I haven't thought of it before? So like the act of writing should be like the, the act of thinking, right? Like they're like kind of one and the same, right? It helps us figure out what we're trying to say too. So even if you don't know what you're saying, like going into it, but you spend some time kind of working out that thought through writing, it's a win-win, right? Then even if like your post technically tanks, like you learn something in the process and then if that just makes it an easier time investment for me. Have you found personally like what you consider success from your content has shifted? Like, not just numbers. I'm not talking about like, oh, like I'll always forever be disappointed with my engagement because like once you get a million plus views and like 25,000 reactions to a post, like nothing will ever feel the same again. So I'm just forever disappointed with myself. But I do like constantly have this internal conversation with myself of like, am I using my powers for good? I have this following like social media is inherently self-serving. But like, can I use it for better things? And so I'm like curious for you if over time those like better results or like success means something really different than it did maybe a year ago. Yeah, that's a really good question. So yeah, kind of like I said, early days, like you're having to, at least I had to like spend more time building, like figuring it out. And it was a combination of like, I want to become a better writer. I want to be able to communicate something clearly. I want to be able to become a better, in some ways, growth marketer by testing things, uh, iterating based on that, trying it again. And so it was kind of a way for me to do all of those in one. But then sort of like surprisingly, it was more of like the community. (laughs) This sounds terrible because social media is meant to be social, but like I guess I was surprised that I just met so many cool people through LinkedIn and just the whole community and uh, aspect of it and being able to talk to those people still online, but having full conversations like we're doing now, like over video and having deeper relationships with those people. Like that's been the most rewarding in some ways of first, like being able to learn from a lot of people that I really respected and grow in different areas that I felt like I was weak in. And then recently it's been a little bit more of like, the the vice versa of I feel like people have been really generous to me right and like their time and their talents and free value uh, and free information and so the more that I can do that I just find like that makes me happier if I can like pass it forward a little bit pay it forward and so that's just kind of how it's shifted a little bit for me and then also there's like the like home life balance too, or personal professional balance too, is it's been a lot more for me of like, how do I find like a better, like personal professional balance, right? And spend like the right amount of time in each spot where I feel like I'm still giving my best, giving to others, having real conversations with people, but also like having a life. So that's yeah. how that's how it lifted for me. What about you? Yeah, I think the most rewarding thing I've been able to do and I've done this a handful of times, is find my friend's jobs. So like when I'll write a post and I'll just like describe a person in detail, there there was like this event that happened a few months back where a company that I did not work for, who I had a friend who was the sales manager and I had a friend who had gone to work for the first friend to be the sales manager at this company. One day they cut the whole sales team. And like, my friend who I had referred over there was the top rep and suddenly he was out of a job like three months three months into this new gig and like just crushing right and I was like I will not rest until he has a new job now he's a baller probably could have found a job on his own but I mean like that's like soul crushing it's really deflating right so I like called him I wrote this like post about him and described him in detail because we used to work together And then I had like 50 plus DMs from hiring managers looking for AEs and SDRs and all this stuff. And so we were able to get him a bunch of interviews. He ended up taking a recruiting gig. He's crushing it. But the other thing was we were able to connect those hiring managers to everybody else who got cut that day. And like it wasn't just one person. It was like five people had jobs by the end of a week. Like that's incredible. And I didn't actually do. I wrote a thing like I just wrote a thing and let it go off into the universe. And so 
that's like what I mean by like, I need to use my powers for good because it's so self-serving for me, if I'm being honest, to like write a post about like the random thought I had about like you're either first in your category or your Pepsi. Like, I think I'm so clever. And I thought that was so funny. And I get likes and comments and whatever. But when you can actually like help somebody or coach someone to be better at their job or help them get a job or make somebody feel less alone in their experience or answer a question or provide a resource, what have you, like that's so much more rewarding. And like, to your point, the genuine relationships that you get to build are awesome. I love it when BDRs hit me up and they're like, hey, my manager told me that like you're somebody to follow on LinkedIn. Do you have 15 minutes to like coach me on social selling? And I'm like, hell yeah, I will take those meetings all day long. And like, I don't really have the extra 15 minutes in my day at this point, but like I make it because I am so grateful for the people who did that for me when I was learning. And yeah, it's just really fun to have that like come full cycle. Yeah, I have all the the warm fuzzies from that. That's great. Yeah, I do think that, yeah, once you have deeper connections with people and uh, you have, you see it go full cycle of one of the most rewarding things for me is my very first job was at an agency, worked with some really talented designers. And now I get to like work with those designers again at Dooley because they're now full-time freelance, right? When you see like relationships come full cycle like that and you help them out, they help you out. Like you see that happen or you see people grow in their career. That's really, really rewarding. So next step is how do you get there, right? So what's like a 30, 60, 90 plan that you'd give someone that's just fresh coming to, to LinkedIn, either from the sales world, marketing world, that's probably mainly who's going to be listening to this, but we'll, we'll uh, keep it focused with that. Yeah, 30 days, I would say first 30 days, overhaul your profile. So make sure it is readable. Make sure that like in the first few seconds that I land on your profile, I understand exactly who you are and exactly what you do, or at least have a really good idea. So that is your tagline. That's the hashtags of the things that you decide to talk about if you have creator mode turned on. That's like the order in which you orient your profile. It's your experience. It's your about section. Your about section should be about you, not about your company. I can Google your company and figure out what your company's about. Your experience section should be like a sizzle reel of all your success. So that I can quickly see like, oh, 175% of quota in Q4, let's go. Or like, oh, you built a partnership like program from scratch or, oh, you designed the content strategy for Dooley from zero to now you manage like 10 people. That's amazing. So I wanna see your accomplishments at the experience section. I would also say you have 100 connections a week, use them. Every single week, you should run out of connection requests. Connect with people. I don't send a note. Wouldn't say that's like best or worst practice by any means. I just don't anymore. But if you do, send something really short and sweet and do not pitch in your notes. So that would be first 30 days. Connect with people, optimize your profile. First 60 days, engage, engage, engage. Just like time block 15 minutes a day to make those connections and comment on people's content. If you like the content, like it and comment on it. It will curate your feed to be more of what you like and less of what you don't. The first few weeks you're on LinkedIn, your feed is gonna be bananas. It's gonna be terrible. You can optimize it by liking the things that you like and just passing by the things that you don't care about. So that would be the next, like that first 60 days is like engage, engage, engage because people will then start seeing your name they're recognizing you, whether you're connected or not. If you can like ask questions, add value to a conversation, do that. Then I would say in that next 30 day block for the final 30 days of that 30, 60, 90, that's when you start creating original content. And I would, for me, start with one to two times a week. And I would just like tell a story about my day. That was how I started. I was just like, Today, somebody hung up on me and I cried about it. And then I like tell like what happened or like today, my manager told me that I don't have any confidence. And I really like sat there and thought about what that meant and how am I going to work on confidence? And he coached me through these three things. So here are my three tips. I'm going to be working on it. I'll follow up with you in a month and see how it goes. So just telling like real stories about your experience. You're an expert in your experience. Nobody is more of an expert in your experience than you. So ask yourself, is this going to help somebody be better at their job or life? Does this make somebody feel something? If the answer is yes to either or both, you are good to post. If not, start over and do that twice a week. Then just like continue on with that cadence. Still be time blocking 15 minutes a day to engage. Still post two or three times a week. Make sure your profile's up to date. 
and eventually the stuff just becomes more natural and then you're going to be, you know, on the roll. Beautiful. Yeah. That's a great get started plan. All right. So how long did it take you to realize that something was working, right? Like when was kind of your light bulb moment with LinkedIn? Cause we talked about this before of you kind of started in 2020, but you had like one post pop up, you continued with it for a couple of weeks. Then you're like, forget it. This doesn't work. And then you like restarted in 2021. So when were those uh, light bulb moments for you? Yeah. So the first post I wrote that like really kind of took off, I shared about my experience, a conference where a guy was just like being really condescending. And I think he like called me sweetheart. And I basically wrote an open letter to this sales leader because he then tried to offer me a job later in the weekend. And I was like, what? Like, what's happening here? But yeah, I wrote an open letter to him about like why it felt condescending. And I didn't like actually tag him or like say his name. I just like wrote as like, dear guy who called me sweetheart at the conference. Like, and then I wrote that. And so many people DM me and like commented about their experiences, like being insulted or like treated as less than at a conference because they were a woman or were a person of color or were disabled or something like that. Like, in the sales world, I don't feel this way anymore. But like when I was first getting started, it felt very like if you are not like a 40 year old white man, you have no like merit in this society. So it's really evolved. And I actually don't even think that's truly what the situation was. It was just my limited experience at that time. And so that worked great. But then I like wasn't writing posts like that anymore. I was just like sharing about my day and people didn't really care what a struggling SDR was doing at that time. And so I stopped. But then I transitioned into marketing from sales. And I was like, okay, I have like another experience where I'm going to be building and learning. I'm going to do this out loud. I started posting every day. And so I think it was a combination of consistency, vulnerability, and like learning out loud, like things people could benefit from, as well as trying to like lean on expertise that I did have is still talking about video prospecting is still talking about like social selling which were things I felt kind of confident in and like all of those ingredients came together but I think the real like true true key and like turnkey part of that was the consistency like when you are posting regularly the algorithm gods are like oh my god we'll boost your content you know (laughs) Yeah, you're a creator at that point, right? Like you are creating things regularly and people for for better or worse, like see our names out there. And so LinkedIn's like, these people must know what they're talking about and like shows it to more people. That's part of it. But yeah, you'd be surprised like how many people just don't post consistently. And so when it's still kind of blue ocean like that, then it feels like you're the only one posting on LinkedIn or you're one of like five people. And so that's something for people to consider too, is that's not exactly how something like search works, right? Like you don't get that opportunity of it's pretty red ocean in there right now. And so for you to like show up because you decided to show up is pretty rare. Everybody's showing up. And so it's hard to make someone's feed or to make the search. So something to consider people are still on the fence. What kind of results did you see from it? Right? So we talked about quantitatively, like what results that you got from building from what, like 3000 to 18,000. But then let's just talk about things that are less quantitative, uh, more like qualitative results that you got from it. Yeah. So I would say the qualitative results are definitely the more important ones. The last two jobs I have landed going to Dooley, going to spec it, I did not have to apply. So I still like interviewed with people, but there was no need for me to like submit a resume and send in an application like people came to me and lots of people came to me before those opportunities they were just the ones that I took at those times and lots of people still like people I just started spec two weeks ago and I've got recruiters in my dms like do you want to come work over here like no (laughs) but I would say that's a huge one so just like you never really need a resume again LinkedIn can truly function as a digital resume and not in the way of like create a resume, click that button that LinkedIn has, but it functions as like your proof of work. And then obviously, like if you have connections and people like those are people who could potentially attest to your work. I've done side projects with a lot of these creators. Like I I have friends who have a hundred thousand followers that I could tap on the shoulder and say, like, would you be a reference for me for this? And that's because I've spent time on this platform. So it's definitely the relationships. It's definitely like 
the social trust around my own brand that has kind of developed. And I would also say it's just like opened up opportunity. If I could like sum it all up, it, it opens up opportunity. I was able to start a side business doing consulting with companies. Like I do ghostwriting, I do brand coaching, and I do, I'm like on retainer with a handful of companies where I just like give them, re like I have like a handful of things I'm really good at and other stuff I'm like very mediocre at. And I get to just like work with these companies and offer my expertise for a couple of months and hopefully help them get better and grow. And none of that would happen if nobody knew who I was. So at the end of the day, like the qualitative result is visibility and visibility beats ability if no one can see the ability. I would not say I am better at my job than somebody else with my same title. I am not smarter. I just have a louder microphone. And so like, that's the way that I see it. And that's a privilege. And I, I'm really like fortunate to have those opportunities. And that like kind of circles back to that question of like, how do I use my powers for good? And just to make sure that I'm, I'm trying to give opportunity to other people that I know or help people when I have that chance, because like, I feel like there's, an, there's a chance to get back in that way. Yeah, I love it. Like at a basic level, you can't buy from a company that you don't know exists, right? And you can't hire a candidate that you don't know exists. And for both of those, like both are looking for solutions fast, usually like you're not like, if you need something, you're not like looking for a year typically. Yeah. You're like, oh, I, I need community manager or like I need a sales solution to be able to move deals forward. Right. And so to being top of mind is kind of like step number one in like the basic marketing framework of like awareness. So that's kind of like a, an easy way to simplify it for folks is like, if you want opportunities, like start with just being top of mind for the thing that you want and then drill down into that by being like the expert in that thing too. So that's my quick recap of that. What are some examples of companies that you think are doing this really well? Companies or individuals? Companies or individuals staying top of mind. Um, I'm going to use some like not so classic examples. Okay. Company I saw this week, RepView. I'm a fan of RepView and what they do. And all of those sites that like, I'm not anti Glassdoor by any means, but Glassdoor sometimes I feel like it's either like the disgruntled employee or the like HR people posting five star and like one star reviews to the company. So you just don't get like a very clear picture. You get that like top 10, bottom 10% of experience and you don't really understand that middle part. RetView is like this interesting company. And also I'm not an influencer of theirs. I'm not getting paid to say this. I just noticed this week. They're an interesting company that shows like compensation and like who's hitting quota and whatever. And it's all anonymous. And it's like all the big tech companies that you kind of a thing. And so earlier this week, I saw three posts tagging RetView, like bragging about this thing about them. So I DM somebody on their marketing team and I was like, game recognized game. You went into the influencer route. And they were like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then they kind of told me like, yeah, like we have people who post about us. And I just think that's so interesting. Like companies are no longer just relying on themselves or like what if you're like an eight person company? Also, I don't know if I just outed review, but sorry, I thought it was a good tactic. I think it's really interesting when you're leveraging the networks of people around you, like full disclosure, Speckit is going to be tapping on the shoulders of our friends who know us and who use us to start creating some like user generated content or friend generated content. And I think that is a great strategy. Like I saw RetView all over my feed that day. And I think that's really good. So that's one company. And then I think, I'm trying to think like an individual that's doing a good job of like creating content and being top of mind. I see Darren McKee everywhere these days. Love that guy. He's just like all over my feed. He works at BetterUp. And he's just bringing some fun, bringing some energy, bringing some awareness to like work-life balance and what that really means and how to how to achieve that and how to like find an employer who respects that and how to break into tech and things like that. And he works for BetterUp, which like does this sort of, it's like a work-life balance from what I understand sort of solution. So it's kind of perfect that he is speaking to his experience. It kind of ties back to his product. He's all over my feed just a genuinely nice guy. He sends me DMs from time to time just to check in. So fan of Darren, fan of RepView. Those are the two examples off the top of my head. 
Nice. I love both of them. Yeah, I feel like the better up content, I'm like, man, that'd be fun to like create content at that company. Like you're just talking about work life balance constantly and like pumping people up. Yeah, <laughs> so who doesn't want to be like, oh, you should take a break. You deserve a break or like you deserve to like meditate or like how nice to just talk about like work life balance benefits. I don't know. I just think that would be so lovely. And yeah, it'd be fun to write content for a company like that. Okay, so very last thing, and I promise I'll, I'll let you go eventually. What resources <laughs> What resources do you need to get started? You obviously need a LinkedIn account. Any other like tech or resources or friends that you need to get started on LinkedIn? So I would definitely like first things first, follow creators who do what you want to do or like people you want to learn from. So if you're in sales, follow people like, Scott Lease, Amy Bolas, Daniel Ryan, Ryan Scalera, like who else in sales are some good sales? Kyle people. Coleman. Kyle Coleman. Yes. Will Kyle. all yeah. like mm -hmm. follow people who speak to the things that you're trying to do well or trying to learn. If you're in marketing, follow Camille, follow like Nick Bennett, Aaron Balsa, Mark Young. I'm trying to think of some other marketers that I really like. I know there's tons of them out there. I paid, Wait, Gosh, I paid you to say this, just yeah, like to, to plug me in this. Totally. The whole purpose of this. I would say all of me, but like I'm such a wild card. I'm posting about like mental health and sales and marketing. So like roll the dice and see if you want to follow me, unfollow me. I won't be offended. Yeah, like follow the people you want to learn from. So that would be a great place to start. And then like just like DM people and, and ask for help. You'd be shocked at how many people are willing to help you. If they have the time, like I almost never say no to helping an SDR or an AE work on personal brand or work on like social selling or video prospecting unless I truly do not have the time. But I almost always can make 15 minutes work. And a lot of people in this community are very, very helpful. I mean, Camille, we met because you DM me to ask me about like sales development or something. I like a video prospecting. I think it was what it was. Like you wanted to ask me about like video tools and stuff. And it was like, yeah, of course, like people are just helpful. I don't know. Like how often do you say no to a conversation with somebody like who's asking you for help if they're being genuine and they're not trying to like sell you something? It's usually a yes. So those would be my first two steps as far as a resource. Bonus resource. This is a paid resource but I'm in love with it these days. Again, they don't pay me to say this. Although, well, if you want to, you can. Lavender is a really interesting email writing tool. I actually started using it for some of my cold DMs if I'm like trying to get a hold of some like like high profile person. And I, I actually, I use it in my like day-to-day -day email life. But Lavender is like an email AI tool, but it's also just like good for messaging. And it's going to give you a score on like how you sound. Are you sounding too pitchy or you sounding too aggressive it has like tonality indicators it has is this too high of a reading level do you have too long of words is it too long in general how long is it going to take for somebody to skim through this message so i would use that to write emails i also think you could probably use it to like write a story and post it on linkedin i haven't tried it but i bet you could the algorithm probably would at least be able to tell you your tone of that message and so that could be a good one for like social selling purposes so that when you are reaching out to those people to ask them for a favor your message is tight so those are the three there you go no that's like a that's the perfect thing to end on so yeah i will say you should follow zoe for the record and that is also what we're doing for for wrap up so zoe where should people find you other than um, linkedin other than linkedin i mean i'm on twitter but i don't know how to use it so i wouldn't recommend that at the moment i post like once a month and i've only been on it for two months so i think i have two posts i <laughs> think and uh, it's not very good I would say LinkedIn is definitely the place to find me, but also every once in a while I go incognito as the Speckett account. So if you see a lowercase response on a post somewhere, it's probably me dressed up as Specky. So yeah, that's where you can find me. Nice. Yeah. I mean, just going along with the theme of doubling down on LinkedIn, right? So find Zoe on LinkedIn, follow her, get more advice like this. And Zoe, thank you for coming on this show again. Good to see your face again. This is all just a ploy to see your face hang again. Up. So <laughs> just to hang out. Yeah. And just talk. So we'll talk soon. And thanks for coming. Thanks for listening to Content Logistics. This episode is produced by Motion, a done-for-you B2B podcasting agency for busy marketers. If you liked what you heard, 
Please follow the show on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.